The opinions expressed in this episode do not necessarily reflect those of the Murderish podcast. Sensitive topics are discussed. Listener discretion is advised. Hey, you guys, I have an exciting announcement to make. I've launched a brand new podcast with my best friend since junior high, Jesse. The podcast is called Judgy and Juryish. On the show, Jesse and I dish on our favorite reality TV shows, and inevitably, stories from our past trickle out, and there's some good ones. If you're into reality TV and need a good palate cleanser after listening to so much true crime, I think you'll enjoy Judgy and Juryish. We release new episodes every week. Search for and subscribe to Judgy and Juryish wherever you're listening now, and leave us a five star rating and review if you can. All right, let's get into today's case. On July 12, 1922, 20-year-old widow Alberta Meadows was bludgeoned to death on a desolate road just outside Los Angeles. Her attacker would garner more media attention and public interest than the victim herself. It was a case that would continue to receive national coverage for decades to come, and not for any of the reasons you would expect. This is Jamie, and you're listening to Murderish. Join me as I walk you through the case of Clara Phillips. This case takes us to Los Angeles, California in the early 1920s, Known historically as the Roaring Twenties and the Jazz Age, Hollywood and the silent motion picture industry saw its heyday begin during this time. Postcards from that time boasted that L.A. was the largest city in the West. The population more than doubled in a single decade. People who lived in the big city were made up of aspiring actors, oil industry moguls, real estate developers, and agricultural workers from Mexico and the rural Midwest. Due to the tireless efforts of the suffragettes, women earned the right to vote in 1920. This newfound sense of freedom empowered women to pursue their dreams. Women starred in, wrote, directed, produced, and edited the films that would usher the city into its golden age. 1920s L.A. swarmed with the dazzling rush of automobiles, jazz music, industrial innovation, and youthful rebellion. Speakeasies flourished, bootleg liquor was a street corner away, and gangsters exploited any chance to make quick cash. It was both a wonderful and treacherous time to be young in Hollywood. Clara Ann Weaver was born on June 23, 1898 in Waco, Texas. Her parents, John and Anna, had five children. Clara was the second youngest, and this led to a very strong emotional bond with the baby of the family, Etta. The Weavers moved around frequently within Texas, sticking mostly to small towns. When Clara was a teen, the family settled down in Houston. It was there that 15-year-old Clara met a charming older man named Armour L. Phillips. The 22-year-old was handsome, intelligent, and notably ambitious. He dreamed of a better life out west and promised Clara that they could live the life they always wanted in California. Armour's sights were set on working in the oil industry. Clara, on the other hand, had grander aspirations— She wanted to be a Hollywood starlet. Clara and Armour were married on November 13, 1913. Wasting little time, they ventured out to Los Angeles to start their new life together. The newlyweds found considerable success in their chosen vocations. Soon after arriving in Hollywood, Clara was hired by film producer Mark Sennett to pose as a bathing beauty. Clara and a handful of other young women were featured in Senate's comedy shorts and print ads, standing together in their swimsuits. Senate was the head of Keystone Studios, and his slapstick routines in silent film were considered groundbreaking in a growingly competitive genre. Senate's bathing beauties, as they were called, gave him a literal leg up on the competition, and Clara was satisfied to get her foot in the door. In fact, 
She soon landed more work, this time as a chorus girl at the Pantages Theater. Clara performed synchronized dancing in vaudeville shows, occasionally traveling to San Francisco when her company toured. She adored the spotlight and the glamorous costumes that came with being a stage performer. Occasionally, she took work as an extra in short films. Armour also did very well in Los Angeles. He got a job as an oil stock salesman with the Sun Oil Company. It was an incredibly lucrative industry. He earned enough to buy expensive suits and hire servants to tend to their large home. He was also financially secure enough to send for Clara's mother and her little sister, Etta, to live in their home for a while. But Clara soon realized she wasn't as enamored with a life of luxury as she had anticipated. Her schedule as a chorus girl always conflicted with Armour's busy work life. She decided to stop working and instead focus on being Mrs. Phillips. To her dismay, Armour still found himself away from the home far more often than Clara liked. He worked long, tireless hours and then went out to dinner with important people in the oil trade. Armour tried to make his wife understand that this was business, an obligation he needed to fulfill in order to maintain his success and their lifestyle. Still, his frequent absences and late-night arrivals made Clara paranoid. Before long, neighbors started gossiping. Speculation about Armour's evening whereabouts became too much to bear and Clara sprung into action. She suspected her husband was engaged in an affair, either by drawing her own conclusions or listening to the rumors neighbors had started. One specific neighbor, Mrs. McElroy, told Clara that Armour intended to run away with his paramour. Clara was not going to sit quietly. She began following her husband all over Los Angeles. One day, she spotted him heading into First National Bank. It just so happened that a beautiful 20-year-old bank teller named Alberta Meadows worked there. Watching her husband from afar as he interacted with Alberta was all the confirmation Clara needed. This woman had to be Armour's mistress. Alberta Gibson Tremaine Meadows was born in an unspecified part of Texas in 1903. Her parents, Fred and Lottie, had two daughters, Alberta and Janora, and a son. Little is known about the life of Alberta's brother. He died during the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. In 1921, at the age of 18, Alberta married 22-year-old construction worker Jesse Marcus Meadows. Tragically, only 10 months into their marriage, Jesse was electrocuted and killed in a work-related accident. Young and widowed, Alberta decided to start the next chapter of her life in California. Absolutely convinced that her husband was romantically involved with the pretty bank teller, Clara flew into a jealous rage. From that moment on, she hatched a plan for revenge. On July 11, 1922, Clara visited the hardware department of a local five-and-dime store. She picked up a 15-cent claw hammer and, according to LA Magazine, asked the store clerk, Do you think this is heavy enough to kill a woman? Thinking she was making a dark joke, the clerk responded, Yes, it is, if you hit her hard enough with it. The next day, Clara met up with her friend Peggy Caffey at a Long Beach speakeasy. The two women had become fast friends as chorus girls on the Pantages Theater circuit. They had stayed in touch for nearly two and a half years but only saw each other on occasion. Coincidentally, Peggy's husband was also an oil promoter. Over several drinks, Clara told Peggy the gossip about her husband's affair. The mix of whiskey and fiery emotions emboldened Clara to take action on her suspicions. She knew where Alberta lived from stalking her around the city for weeks before. Hell-bent on making her rival pay, 
She convinced Peggy to accompany her to Alberta's apartment. But when Clara broke in, she saw that Alberta wasn't home. A new plan was hatched, one that would ensure a confrontation. While taking swigs from a flask, Peggy and Clara waited in the shadows of the bank's parking garage. When Alberta emerged from the bank at the end of her shift, she saw the two women waiting close to her Ford coupe. This didn't raise any alarm bells, as Alberta recognized Clara. After all, the Phillips did their banking where Alberta worked, and on occasion, Clara had accompanied Armour there to withdraw or deposit money. After exchanging pleasantries, Clara asked Alberta for a ride to her sister's house in Montecito Heights. At the time, the neighborhood was a new subdivision in northeast Los Angeles, which was mostly undeveloped. It was a quick drive at that time of night, no more than 15 to 20 minutes long. Alberta agreed and the three women got into the car. Alberta drove through the winding Monterey Hills, engaging in light conversation with Clara and Peggy. Then, on a desolate dirt road, Clara asked Alberta to pull over so they could have a conversation. I feel like a robot these days, repeating the same activities every day. Best Fiends is a fun match three puzzle game that helps me break the monotony. I can play the game anytime on my phone, and there are seemingly an endless number of levels, so the fun never ends. I've competed against friends who are also slightly obsessed with Best Fiends, and it's such a rush to be at a higher level than them. I've been accused of being competitive before. I've been playing Best Fiends for a few months now and it never gets old. There are so many cool characters I've collected, I cannot imagine giving them up. Not only is Best Fiends fun, but it feels like my brain is getting a workout when I play because you have to strategize and use brain power to advance to the next level. Download Best Fiends free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. When I'm doing chores, my makeup, or on a long road trip, Audible is my best friend. In the Audible app, I can access thousands of titles including audiobooks, podcasts, and Audible exclusive originals that aren't available anywhere else. Recently, I binged A Serial Killer's Daughter by Carrie Rawson, and it made my road trip fly by. Whether you're into comedy, true crime, history, health and wellness, or politics, Audible has something for everyone. With Audible Plus, you get even more content, like the Words Plus Music series. I also love listening to titles that are narrated by the author on Audible. It just brings me closer into the story. Visit audible.com slash murderish or text murderish to 500-500. That's A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot com slash murderish or text murderish to 500-500 to check out Audible today. Under the night sky, Clara confronted Alberta about the alleged affair. She also accused her husband of paying for Alberta's car tires and her flashy wristwatch as tokens of his affection. Of course, Alberta denied all of the allegations. Clara didn't believe her. And then she responded furiously. Clara proceeded to pummel Alberta with her fists, frantic to get away. Alberta cracked the car door open, only to be hit with such force that she fell out of the vehicle. Alberta took off running, but her shoe heel snapped in two. She tripped and fell again, which gave her attacker a chance to catch up. Clara had entered the car with a hammer, concealed in her overcoat. Now that her victim was defenseless, Clara bludgeoned Alberta relentlessly with both the hammerhead and the claw. To ensure she paid with her life, Clara found a large boulder and threw it down on Alberta's mangled head. Peggy watched in horror from the car as the violent scene unfolded. Alberta lay motionless and discarded as the other two women drove away from the brutal scene. 
According to an article from the Ogden Standard Examiner, the lifeless body of 20-year-old Alberta Meadows was discovered by Mrs. Fred Whites. She had been driving along the serene mountain road when she spotted the victim. Clara had not even attempted to cover her up. For two days, Alberta's body lay unidentified and unnoticed. Mrs. Whites contacted authorities without delay. Officer Harry M. Hill quickly arrived at the crime scene. While searching the surrounding area, he recovered a crushed hat and a whiskey flask, which was nearly empty. He also took the boulder resting on Alberta's body into evidence. When the shocking story broke, the L.A. press went wild. Every detail of the case was followed by newspapers all over the country. The Long Beach Police Department began investigating the gruesome murder. With few leads, however, detectives had no choice but to wait it out in hopes someone would come forward with information. As if on cue, Armour Phillips came into police headquarters. He told Sheriff William H. Traeger his wife had confessed to the murder on the night it was committed and he could no longer hide the truth. It turns out Clara had gone straight home after brutally killing her supposed nemesis. According to the LA Times, Clara had told Armour upon arriving home, Darling, I have killed the one you love most in this world. Now I'm going to cook you the best supper you ever had. After a suspect emerged in the case, the press had a field day with it. Though it's difficult to track which newspaper coined the term first, the Los Angeles Times assigned Clara Phillips the moniker Tiger Woman. The name apparently came from a comment made by one of the patrolmen who first laid eyes on Alberta's body. He said she looked like she had been mauled by a tiger. There were variations on the name assigned to Clara, mainly Tiger Girl, Tiger Lady, and the Hammer Murderess. The nation watched in fascinated horror as more specifics about the case emerged. How could a beautiful young housewife be capable of committing such an atrocious act? That was the question on everyone's minds from coast to coast. Initially, Armour helped his wife cover up the brutal crime. Stunned by her casual admission, at first, Armour went into survival mode. He admitted to police that initially he helped his wife dispose of her blood-stained clothing. Clara took Alberta's car to the parking lot of the Greek theater in nearby Pomona while Armour trailed behind. The victim's car was abandoned there. Lastly, there was the murder weapon. All that remained of the hammer was the handle. Clara had struck Alberta with such force that the hammer broke. Armour threw the remaining handle into a wooded area. He would later take detectives to Pomona to locate the handle, but it wasn't found until later by investigators. The morning after the murder, Armour put his wife on a train to Tampico, Mexico, where she had distant relatives. Upon hearing she had left town, police put out a telegraph warning authorities along the train route that Clara was a wanted woman. On July 14th, when the train reached Tucson, Arizona, Clara was greeted by police and a crowd of reporters. The LA Evening Press asked Armour why he had been complicit. He responded, I was afraid for her safety. She wanted to give herself up in the first place. I wish the public would understand this or quit talking and criticizing me. Does the public realize what it means when the person you love best in the world is in terrible trouble and you have to decide what is best for her, Peggy must have also felt conflicted between her sense of loyalty to her friend and the moral duty to report the attack she witnessed. She came forward the day after Armour and told investigators what had transpired the night of the murder. As the only witness, her testimony would be crucial at the upcoming trial. When asked by the LA Evening Press in an October 1922 article why she waited three days to go to authorities, Peggy responded she was not physically able to tell it earlier, that the sickening sight she had witnessed 
caused her to faint and left her unable to tell. Upon capture, Clara had in her possession three diamond rings and a handbag containing bloodied ladies' gloves. Peggy informed detectives Clara had stolen the dead woman's handbag and her rings to complicate the identification of Alberta's body. Luckily, it had only delayed the investigation by a few days, thanks to Armour turning his wife in. With nervous anticipation, the nation anxiously awaited the Tiger Woman's trial. The sensational trial began on October 20, 1922. On the first day, the Hall of Records was a chaotic scene both inside and out. According to the Los Angeles Times, the courtroom was stormed by 300 to 400 people hoping to hear the proceedings. Most of them were women. Hundreds more crowded the streets just hoping to catch a glimpse of the notorious murderess. Onlookers were such a nuisance that Sheriff Traeger asked the Board of Supervisors to issue a no-loitering order. Reluctantly, the crowd dispersed. They would have to read about the trial in the newspapers, where updates were printed daily. The first few witnesses who took the stand were five employees from First National Bank. As stated in the Los Angeles Evening Post record, the employees testified that Clara had visited the bank and inquired about Alberta. They said Clara had asked them not to tell Alberta that she had been there. As part of the investigation, detectives had reviewed Alberta's bank records. What they uncovered must have angered the victim's family even more. As it turned out, Clara's suspicions about her husband purchasing gifts for his accused mistress had been unfounded. Alberta's bank records revealed that she had used her own money to purchase the car tires and wristwatch. The money for those items came from a small inheritance Alberta received after she had been widowed. It seemed clear that Clara's husband had nothing to do with buying these items for Alberta. Also testifying on the first day at trial was the responding officer to the crime scene, Officer Hill. In the Los Angeles Evening Post record, it was said he testified about the gruesome condition of the body. He displayed the 60-pound boulder, still stained with blood, that had been found resting on the victim's shoulder. Alberta's blood-stained hat was also exhibited to the jury. The hat had a hole through it where the hammer claw punctured the crown. The prosecution, led by Deputy District Attorney Charles W. Fricky, leaned heavily on the testimony of Clara's friend, Peggy Caffey. She took the stand several days into the trial. As Peggy recounted the events of that fateful night, you could hear a pin drop in the courtroom. Everyone listened in suspense and disbelief, as she was essentially their eyes and ears during the crime. A few questions into cross-examination, Peggy was asked about the hammer. According to the Los Angeles Evening Express, Clara hissed in Peggy's direction, Tell the truth, Peggy. Tell them you bought the hammer. But Peggy proceeded to tell the jury what she witnessed the night of the crime. She said that Clara purchased the hammer the day before they had met up for drinks in Long Beach. It had been Clara's idea to seek vengeance upon Alberta. After Clara turned violent and dealt the initial blow with the hammer, Alberta ran down the hill screaming. Peggy testified that she attempted to catch up to them, but according to the New York Daily News, Clara looked up at her friend and shouted, Damn you, get away or I'll kill you too. Desperate to intervene, Peggy climbed up the hill yelling for help. No one heard her cries. As documented by the Los Angeles Times, Peggy continued by saying, I turned around and looked back after a while. I saw Mrs. Meadows lying on the ground and Mrs. Phillips crouching above, striking with the hammer. It rose and fell, rose and fell. My God, it was horrible. Peggy went on to say that she hadn't gone straight to the police initially because Clara threatened her life if she didn't keep quiet. Of course, Clara denied the validity of Peggy's testimony. 
From the beginning, the defense's approach was apparent. Attorney Bertram Harrington strived for an insanity plea. According to the Tampa Times, he argued that his client's mental balance had been upset by the conduct of her husband. To solidify this claim, depositions from friends Clara had when she lived in Texas were read in court. They stated that Clara's father, John Weaver, had been mentally unstable in the years leading up to his death. Not only that, Clara's brother Henry was mentally handicapped. Clearly, Harrington was trying to convey that mental illness ran in Clara's family, so it wouldn't be a stretch that Clara herself was mentally unstable. When Clara took the stand, she had a completely different version of events than her former friend, Peggy. Leaning heavily on her charm and acting skills, Clara told the jury that Peggy was the mastermind behind the attack. As mentioned in the New York Daily News, after Alberta denied that Armour had bought her the gifts, Peggy asked Clara if she was going to let her get away with it. Through a veil of tears, Clara told the court that Alberta admitted she loved Armour. Clara testified that Peggy started beating Alberta. That was the last thing Clara saw before she supposedly blacked out. While some of the jury may have believed Clara's spin on events, the fact that she had fled by train was deeply incriminating. If Peggy had been responsible for Alberta's death, why had Peggy stayed in town while Clara left? It didn't add up. Alma Whitaker, a journalist for the Los Angeles Times, wrote an editorial piece about the trial and what she observed. She said about Armour, It didn't seem possible that any woman as bright as Clara could have considered him worth all that agony. To me, he looked just a mediocre sort of chump, not too bright mechanic, in his best clothes, immeasurably impressed with his important role in the proceedings. Whereas there really is some class to Clara. No matter what my belief, I felt compelled to admire her poise. Other papers mentioned how Armour stood by his wife, even going into debt to hire her attorney. The journalist had a point about Clara's demeanor. Onlookers were mesmerized by her beauty. According to the magazine Medium, one male juror was quoted as saying, she had the most appealing smile I ever saw but the prosecution tried their best to make even Clara's greatest admirers look past her magnetism. Harping on the sheer brutality of the crime was the main focus. According to the Los Angeles Evening Post record, Mr. R.E. Despain, an undertaker where the victim's body had been held while awaiting identification, said, there was a hole in the back of the head so big he could place his fist in it. Also shown to the jury was a photo of Alberta's body post-mortem. Her face had been so badly maimed, she was barely recognizable. For those of you who might be going back to work soon, ditch your uncomfortable dress pants and try Beta Brand's dress pant yoga pants. It's bad enough that you have to deal with gossipy Gloria at the water cooler but at least you can rock comfortable, well-fitting, and stylish dress pants while she bends your ear. Listen, I've been telling you about Beta Brand for a long time now, and that's because their dress pant yoga pants and yoga denim are game changers. I wear them almost every day. Their yoga denim are so soft and have the perfect amount of stretch for comfort and body contouring. Now that I've discovered Beta Brand, it's impossible to go back to wearing jeans that suffocate me when I sit, or jeans that I have to constantly pull outward so they don't dig into my sides. Right now, my listeners can get 30% off their first Beta Brand order when you go to betabrand.com murderish. That's 30% off your first order for a limited time at betabrand.com murderish. Discover what it's like to be comfortable and confident all the time. Go to betabrand.com slash murderish for 30% off. We all have enough stress right now. Dinner should not be adding to that. My family and I love HelloFresh because it takes the stress out of going to the grocery store and meal planning and dinner is ready in about 30 minutes. 
It's great because we can customize our meals each week and skip a week whenever we want. Not to mention healthy meals are delivered right to our doorstep. My daughter and I made the sesame beef tacos recently and they were so good. They were on the table in 20 minutes and we only had to use one pan to cook them, which means less dishes. I'm addicted to convenience, so HelloFresh is right up my alley. Go to hellofresh.com slash murderish12 and use code murderish12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. That's hellofresh.com slash murderish12 and use code murderish12, HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Another indictment against both Mr. and Mrs. Phillips came to light while the trial was unfolding. The couple faced assault charges in Houston, Texas, which were filed by Clara's stepfather, G.L. McDonald. In an incident unrelated to Alberta's murder, during an altercation with McDonald, Armour had allegedly sent Clara to her sister's house to retrieve a gun. When she returned, she fired a single shot at her stepfather and missed. Charges of assault with intent to commit murder were filed on January 26, 1922. The couple had been held in jail for two hours before being released. Then they left town. Undoubtedly, the press on this finding swayed public opinion. If nothing else, the publicity this incident received showed Clara's propensity for violence. Legally, however, it couldn't factor into the murder trial. When Clara's trial ended, a jury of three women and nine men took nearly 24 hours to deliberate. In fact, they failed to come to a verdict on the final day of trial. Judge Frederick W. Hauser had the jurors stay in a hotel across the street from the Hall of Records and return to court the following day. Prosecutors sought the death penalty, but rumors swirled in the press that several members of the jury were leaning toward acquittal. One juror, Joseph C. Mailer, would speak to the Long Beach Telegram post-trial to say, There were eight ballots cast in 12 hours, and at no time was anyone in favor of acquittal. The first ballot was five, three women and two men, in favor of hanging, three in favor of a first-degree murder verdict with life imprisonment, four including myself for second-degree murder with life imprisonment. When asked by the Los Angeles Times how he thought the verdict would pan out for his client, attorney Harrington said she undoubtedly realizes her violent temper has got her in a position where there is only one thing she can expect, and that is the punishment she deserves. She knows she is going to get it, and all she is hoping for is that it won't be the death penalty. On November 16th, a verdict was reached. Clara Phillips was found guilty of second-degree murder. Onlookers in the courtroom described Clara as being emotionless as the verdict was read. Some news outlets believed that Clara had gotten off with too light of a sentence. As the New York Daily News put it, she missed the electric chair by a smile. The Pittsburgh Daily Press added, Clara Phillips holds a fascination for men and under the influence of her Mona Lisa smile, her wickedness is forgotten and she compels sympathy. The sentencing hearing was held a few days later on November 28th. Clara was sentenced to serve 10 years to life at San Quentin Penitentiary. She was held at the Los Angeles County Jail for 10 days to give her attorney a chance to file an appeal. While she sat in her cell, she hatched another plan one that would boggle the minds of authorities, the press, and her admirers. On December 5th, eight days after being in jail, Clara's fourth-floor cell was found empty by a guard. The jailhouse was situated in the busy downtown business district, an area with lots of foot traffic, along with automobiles and trolleys passing through frequently. Nearby street lamps illuminated both the building and its surrounding blocks. The New York Daily News remarked on Clara fleeing imprisonment by calling it an unprecedented escape after an unprecedented crime. The newspaper went on to detail how she had managed her escape. 
The news report read, three iron bars and a square of sash netting in the window had been sawed through, leaving a hole barely large enough for a slender woman to wriggle through. A nightgown rolled up on the bed concealed the sawed-off bars, whose ends showed that they had been held in place with chewing gum until the job was completed. A curtain concealed the bars and kept Clara's flight hidden until after daylight. The article continued, Barefooted, she had climbed through the window, and a confederate on the roof had fastened a rope under her armpits and dragged her up to the roof. From there, they had shinned down a drain pipe to the lower roof of the county charity's building next door, and then down to a ladder to the alley where an automobile was waiting. What followed was deemed by the St. Louis Post-Dispatch as the greatest woman hunt in criminal history. For nearly five long months, authorities tried to track the Tiger Woman down. Tips came in to the L.A. police claiming that Clara was sighted in various places all over the world. Every tip had to be followed as a potential lead. Remember, this was in the days long before any kind of tracking technology or national law enforcement database. The search spanned the United States, Mexico, and Central America. Detectives brought in bloodhounds and used radio, airplanes, and boats to supplement their frequent patrols by car. Upon hearing the news of Clara's escape, Peggy feared for her life. She went into protective custody in case her former friend was out for revenge. Little did anyone know, Clara had left the country. On April 25, 1923, Clara was finally tracked down and her identity was confirmed. The combined efforts of Los Angeles detectives and local police led to her discovery in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. According to the Los Angeles Times, several weeks after being detained there, Sheriff Traeger and his wife personally traveled to Honduras to extradite the Tiger Woman back to the U.S. Clara, always eager to cast herself in a good light, initially claimed that she had been kidnapped from jail and taken to the cellar of an L.A. house. Just like with the murder case, the real story gradually emerged. Clara had been assisted in her escape by Jesse Carson, a journalist who had become infatuated with her. In her own words, Clara described what had transpired to the Spokesman Review in an article dated October 30th, 1932. She said, Jesse Carson got me out of jail at Los Angeles. He sawed the bars from the outside and lifted me from my cell to the roof. He and I fled together from the roof to the street, there an automobile waiting. In it, we drove to a house on Whittier Boulevard. From the day of my escape in December until early January, I was hidden in that house. We waited for what we considered a favorable opportunity to get out of Los Angeles. It was a long wait. Soon after the first of the year, Carson and I started for New Orleans. There we were hidden in a house which Carson said was protected. On January 19th, we sailed for Veracruz. Not long after I started for Mexico with Carson, I was sorry I had gone with him. Frequently, I tried to get away from him, but he threatened me. After the trip to Veracruz, we went by rail to Mexico City. There, Carson began to show his real nature. He began drinking hard. He had pawned all my jewelry while we were hiding in L.A. and had got $110 for it. I was in his power completely because he had all the funds. And besides, he had a gun and threatened to shoot me if I did not do as he said. Regardless of whether the details she gave were entirely factual, new information surfaced due to the widespread media coverage. Jesse and Clara had been joined by Clara's sister, Etta, for at least some of the excursion. They had also been staying at her house after the initial escape. In an article that appeared in the News and Observer in Raleigh, North Carolina, it was mentioned that a private plane used to fly from L.A. to Silver City, New Mexico, was owned by international drug smugglers. The same criminal enterprise had sheltered Jesse, Clara, 
and an unidentified woman in Honduras. Remember before COVID-19, when we could go to shows or celebrate in person or have family gatherings where the only worry was when someone was going to talk politics? Let's get back to that. Let's get vaccinated. COVID-19 vaccines are safe, effective, and free. Sure, we'll have to keep wearing masks for a while, but you know what? This is the start. Go to covid19.nj.gov slash vaccine to register for your vaccination. Remember traveling somewhere? Anywhere? Yeah, let's get back to that. Remember before COVID-19, when we could go to shows or celebrate in person or have family gatherings where the only worry was when someone was going to talk politics? Let's get back to that. Let's get vaccinated. COVID-19 vaccines are safe, effective, and free. Sure, we'll have to keep wearing masks for a while, but you know what? This is the start. Go to covid19.nj.gov slash vaccine to register for your vaccination. Remember traveling somewhere? Anywhere? Yeah, let's get back to that. Once they were caught, no one in the trio fought extradition. Clara's cooperation led to the guarantee of parole. On June 2, 1923, Clara was brought to San Quentin Prison. She was eligible for parole in the spring of 1935. Jesse Carson was punished for his role in Clara's escape by being jailed for 30 days in Hackensack, New Jersey, for disorderly conduct. There is no mention of him having any further correspondence with Clara Phillips. Although Clara would never again attempt to break out of prison, there was a reported suicide attempt during her time in San Quentin. She had also gotten into trouble for flirting with a male inmate. Thomas J. Price was serving time for two charges of burglary and one of assault with a deadly weapon. Like Clara, Price was physically attractive and had many admirers, both within the prison walls and on the outside. Though Clara was nine years older than him, she won his affections over his other female callers. They were romantically entangled for at least 12 weeks. The relationship was halted when a guard caught them exchanging lewd love letters. As punishment, Price was put into solitary confinement and lost two months of good behavior credits. Clara lost two and a half months of special privileges, including visitation rights, library usage, and the ability to receive mail. Clara gave a handful of interviews to newspapers during her prison term. In 1931, she spoke of her crime to the Los Angeles Times, stating, I fought with Alberta on the top of Montecito Drive to protect the only love I have ever known. I did what any mother in the world would do if she saw her baby being taken from her. Armour L. Phillips is my baby. He had been my only baby. He is my very life, and when I realized he was being taken from me, I fought so I might always have him. By that point, any communication from Armour had petered out. Visits became less frequent, and letters from him were sparse. He moved on with his life, filing for divorce from Clara in 1938. Armour relocated to the East Coast later that year. In an odd turn of events, during the summer of 1934, Armour was a suspect in an armed robbery case in Brooklyn, but was later cleared. In 1932, Clara was transferred to the California Institution for Women, a women's state prison in Tehachapi. She was released on parole on June 21, 1935, after serving 12 years and 15 days. On the day of her release, she was greeted by the press and hundreds of supporters who all chanted Tiger Woman as Clara walked the path toward freedom. For a time after her prison term, Clara moved to San Diego where she cared for her ill mother. She worked as a dental assistant for many years, a trade she had learned in prison. After her mother passed away, Clara petitioned the state and won the right to move back to Texas. Then, she completely disappeared from public view. Though Alberta Meadows' legacy has faded over time, the jealousy that led to her death is a timeless concept. In today's headlines, we see acts of violence based on broken hearts, suspicions of betrayal, 
and volatile desires for vengeance. While much has changed since the 1920s, unfortunately, love, or some twisted form of it, is still a common motive for murder today. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Murderish. Don't forget to follow or subscribe to my new podcast, Judgy and Juryish. If you'd like to hear sources for this episode, stick around after the closing music. Also stick around to hear a promo and a trailer for two podcasts. The first promo is for a new podcast called Zodiac Speaking. And the trailer is for a podcast that covers the case of nine-month-old Jacob Landon out of New Mexico. Check out Murderish.com if you want to buy Murderish merch like t-shirts, face masks, and more. If you can't get enough Murderish, subscribe to our Patreon service to get immediate access to bonus content only available to Patreon subscribers. You can sign up for Patreon at Murderish.com where there's a link to go behind the scenes and become a Patreon subscriber. I want to connect with you guys. Follow me on Instagram at Murderish Podcast and on Twitter at Murderish Pod or join the Murderish Facebook group where we have so much fun. Don't forget to tell a friend about the podcast and write a review for Murderish in your favorite listening app. Murderish is mixed and mastered by John and Jessica Buchanis of Audio Editing Solutions. Music is by Nico of We Talk of Dreams. This episode was researched and written by Allison Schwartz. As always, Ishers, thank you for joining me on another episode of Murderish. And remember, listening to this podcast doesn't make you a murderer. It just means you're murder-ish. I'm Mike Morford, and I've been researching the Zodiac case for years. Zodiac, just the name. It sounds sinister. It inspires fear. The fact that a serial killer would give himself this moniker is disturbing. He would go on to taunt police by sending letters and codes to newspapers for years. And the attacks, they were something else altogether. If you were a young couple in a secluded area, you could easily be a target. And it wasn't just shootings on dark lovers' lanes. Zodiac would even attack with a knife in broad daylight while wearing an executioner-style hood. After a while, Zodiac changed tactics, and even lone cab drivers weren't safe. The Zodiac killer terrorized the San Francisco Bay Area and then vanished, but he left a lot of clues behind along the way. Clues that we're going to examine closely on the new podcast, Zodiac Speaking. New episodes of Zodiac Speaking come out every other Saturday starting March 13, 2021. Subscribe today wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a single episode. Hi, I'm Jules from Riddle Me That True Crime. I'm Robin Warder from The Trail Went Cold, and Jules and I want to tell you a little bit about a case that means a great deal to us. The death of nine-month-old baby Jacob Landine on April the 10th, 1987 in Socorro, New Mexico. The day prior to his death on April 9th, baby Jacob was being watched by his mother Brenda's new boyfriend, John not his real name, in his mobile home on 1453 Fatima Drive. While John was babysitting Jacob, Jacob would incur what would be his second head injury in a period of weeks. The prior head injury was a subdural hematoma, or brain bleed, and it was serious enough that it needed to be lanced to take pressure off baby Jacob's brain while being monitored by doctors over the course of several days. The circumstances surrounding how Jacob was injured and subsequently died are murky at best, with the suspect giving multiple versions of the events of the day, ranging from Jacob choking and accidentally hitting his head while trying to dislodge a cookie, to Jacob falling and John returning to see the injured infant. The suspect also reportedly confessed to two officers that he was indeed responsible, but there is no paper or audio record of this confession in the police file. The reasons given by the DA for not pursuing the case are confusing as well, with one of the reasons being that they were worried that John would file charges against the state. It was the opinion of the doctors that baby Jacob was struck in the head and this was no accident. In the years to follow, John goes on to sexually abuse young Eric, as well as physically abusing his mother Brenda and emotionally abusing and isolating them both, making the world very small. 
During the autopsy, layers of abuse seem to be present. A healing rib fracture from around the time of the first head injury is also discovered. It's impossible to say exactly when the injury took place, but what is clear is that someone was abusing young Jacob, and that person was most likely John. Eric Landin, Jacob's brother, has been fighting to get justice for him. However, he faces some obstacles such as the statute of limitations of six years on second-degree murder that State Representative Bill Ream has petitioned to have overturned. Join Robin and I, as well as criminologist Dr. Ashley Wellman, an investigative expert, a legal expert, a forensic psychiatrist, as well as Jacob's brother Eric, as we explore all angles of this case and try to bring awareness, understanding, and hopefully, ultimately, justice for Jacob. The series starts on March the 1st. Tune in on your favorite podcast app. Sources for this episode include a CreateSpace independent publishing article dated May 9th, 2018 by Barry R. Flowers, a KCET article dated November 7th, 2017 by Hillary A. Hallett, an article by The Guardian dated February 5th, 2018 by Judith Mackerel, a Medium.com article dated September 26th, 2019 by Heather Monroe, an article by The News and Observer out of Raleigh, North Carolina dated January 20th, 1935 by Pelman Morin, a Laugham's Quarterly article dated August 13th, 2013 by Anne Helen Peterson, an LA Times article dated August 8th, 1994 by Cecilia Rasmussen, an LA Mag article dated June 24, 2013 by Joan Renner, a Los Angeles Evening Express article dated October 27, 1922 by Oliver Reginald Tavener, an Associated Press article in the Tampa Times dated November 1, 1922, an Associated Press article in the Los Angeles Times dated November 15, 1922, an Associated Press article in the Los Angeles Evening Press dated July 18, 1922, an article in the Long Beach Telegram dated April 26, 1923, a United Press article in the Los Angeles Evening Post record dated October 30, 1922, a United Press article in the Anniston Star dated November 28, 1922, a New York Daily News article dated March 9, 1924, an article in the Ogden Standard Examiner dated October 26, 1922, an article in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch dated May 20th, 1923. An article in the San Francisco Examiner dated May 27th, 1923. An article in the Spokesman Review dated October 30th, 1932. An article in the Los Angeles Evening Post Record dated August 24th, 19-